Hello and welcome to this MCA webinar, Driving Your Motor from Novice to Expert. My name is Carrie Hitchner and I'm the Marketing Manager for the Motion Control Association. This webinar will be recorded and a link will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. If you have any questions, please submit them in the questions panel of your webinar screen and we will answer questions via email after the webinar has concluded. I'd now like to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. Ryan Kerr and Ross Eisendy. Ryan is the manager of Motor Applications Team at Texas Instruments, where he and his team are responsible for solving customer problems while designing solutions with TI's Motor Drive products. Prior to joining the Motor Drive team, Kerr was the assistant manager for TI's home audio business, where he defined Class D audio amplifiers for consumer applications. He received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Purdue University in Indiana. Ross Eisenbeis is an application engineer at Texas Instruments in the Motor Drive and Hall Effect Sensor Group. His semiconductor industry experience spans nearly 10 years. Ross has been a DRAM product engineer. He's created IC test solutions for USB, FireWire, and PLCE devices. He has defined USB 3.0 and LVDF-based uh, video interface devices, and he now enjoys solving the application level challenges with motor control and hall sensors. Ross holds a BSEE from Iowa State University, plays a variety of sports, and loves downhill skiing. In addition, I'd like to thank our sponsor today, which is Texas Instruments, for supporting this webinar. From drop-in and spin to highly complex industrial motors, TI has the most scalable motor solutions across a broad range of voltage, current, interface, integration, and control options. For over 20 years, TI has been innovating motor solutions and has a proven track record of delivering quality products to motor manufacturers. From the sensor to motor, TI's scalable product portfolio covers the complete signal chain, offering a suite of control, drive stage components and sensing products to support your motor design, in addition to a host of motor reference designs offered via the TI Design Library. TI's products are highly integrated and easy to use to decrease design time. I'd now like to hand it over to Ryan to begin today's presentation. Ryan, you can take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, Carrie mentioned, my name is Ryan Kerr, and I manage the applications team here in uh, TI's Motor Drive business. Um, today, we just wanted to uh, talk about three different motor types, and then Ross is going to go into a lot more details on uh, specifically on a brushless design, uh, where he's going to take you from um, you know starting with the motor specs and then going all the way to completing the uh, the drive design. So first, let's talk about the three motor types. Um, these are the types that we are, are most uh, concerned with here at TI. It's a uh, brush DC, stepper, and a brushless DC. Starting with the, the brush DC, it is, is the lowest cost. It's the easiest to use. Um, the, the control of a brush DC can be sim as simple as hooking up a battery, uh, and the motor will spin. Um, so it's, it's certainly the lowest cost in terms of electronics, in terms of drive, and also the easiest to use. Uh, the disadvantages are that it's, it's noisy. Um, because it does include uh, some brushes inside that can wear out, uh, the lifetime is, is uh, impacted, as well as uh, EMI performance. So if, if, uh, if a, an application is very sensitive to EMI, the uh, the spark gaps um, as the the motor is commutating uh, creates a fair amount of EMI noise. Moving off to the stepper, the stepper is um, is commonly used in a lot of different positioning applications. It has a longer life. Uh, it's quieter relative to a brush DC motor. The control is is typically done in an open loop fashion where where current is regulated. Um, so there's um, uh, typically a, a current regulation loop that needs to be included in the, in the drive electronics. So it's a little more complicated on the drive and the control side, but still relatively simple uh, uh, as a brush DC motor. Moving on to the, the brushless DC, 
Uh, with this, you, you get uh, a lot longer life. Um, it's, it's certainly the quietest of the three motor types. It's uh, commonly used in a lot of high power applications as well as high speed applications. Um, the, the disadvantages is just the drive complexity, so typically requires a, a microprocessor that, that has a little more horsepower than these, um, these other uh, motors require. Um, and a lot of times the, uh, the, the loop is closed either around current uh, or voltage or, or position uh, in, a, in a servo application. So it's going to be the most complex uh, definitely from a drive side. So going on to um, to more details, let's start off with the with the brushed motor. Uh, common application power tools. Power tools is a is a huge market for brushed motor uh, with um, the 18 volt lithium ion tools as well as some of the newer uh, outdoor power tools you see today, uh, blowers and trimmers and things along those lines. Uh, e locks is another application for a low voltage. Uh, brushed motor where you're moving a, a cylinder in and out based off of a keypad entry. Uh, toys, um, a lot of toys uh, use brushed motors and they, uh, they don't use any drive electronics at all. It's simply a matter of, of throwing a switch and, and applying voltage across the motor. Um, but some of these, uh, the more the higher end toys require some sort of a forward or direction control or a, a brake um, modes as well, and in that case, uh, drive electronics would be used. Um, and then other other things you see on there that are commonly found in your home: uh, refrigerator. There's there's uh, fans, uh, dampers that control the the um, the temperature, um, as well as a as a big uh, compressor motor as well to control the uh, the uh, the cooling. Uh, coffee machines and then uh, floor care robots are definitely a growing growing market that requires several motors, uh, both in the drive wheels as well as the uh, the cleaning brush on the front and then the uh, the vacuum motor. So so what exactly is is a brush motor? So a brush motor uh, consists of a, a stator on the outside of the moment uh, the motor, which is usually made up of permanent magnets. Uh, the rotor on the inside is, uh, is, is made up of windings and it is the electromagnet in the system. And the windings are connected to, uh, to a power source. Um, and power is provided to the windings uh, through, through brushes. Um, these brushes are connected to, uh, to a battery um, or uh, to an H-bridge of some sort for, uh, for controlling uh, the direction um, of the rotation of the magnetic field. So as the rotor approaches alignment, the, the brushes move across the, contact, the contacts and the next winding is, is energized. So you can see this um, uh, in the animation. Uh, electromagnet magnets in the rotor um, create a, a rotating mechanical uh, motion. So we talked about you could just hook up a battery to a motor and it would spin, but in a lot of applications you actually need to change direction. And how this is accomplished is uh, is um, quite simply um, to to change the the current. Uh, through the uh, through the coils, so this is done with uh, with an with an H bridge, and these are the drive electronics that TI provides, and they're integrated brushed uh, DC motor drivers. So in this case, you can see that we have uh, applied a voltage, uh, positive and negative, from one output to the other, and current flows in the, the direction shown there in the blue arrows. If we want to change direction, then we enable the opposite FETs. We go through a, a dead time period there where all of the FETs are off to, uh, to avoid shoot through. Uh, and then we enable the opposite FETs. So we enable the high side on the right and the low side on the left to uh, 
to change the voltage across the uh, across the commutator and move current in the opposite direction. So these are the 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 states uh, in our in a brush motor driver. So you'll see, if you open any of our data sheets, you'll see a truth table that looks uh, very similar to this. Um, and this goes through the, the four states of, uh, of the H bridge that are required. So the first state is, is coast. In this state, the, all of the FETs are actually in a high Z condition. Uh, so in this state, none of the transistors are enabled. Um, current actually still flows through the body diodes of the, uh, of the FETs. In the forward state, current flows from OUT1, OUT2 as shown in the previous slide. In the reverse state, current flows from OUT2 to OUT1, also shown in the previous slide. And in the break state, current actually recirculates through the low side FETs. So the advantage of, of an integrated driver, because um, certainly this H-bridge could be, could be built discreetly, um, the, the main advantage of an integrated driver is, is the protection uh, that is built in. Uh, so in a discrete solution, you'd have to have some sort of a, a fuse in order to protect the device from shorts on the outputs or, or shorts in the FETs. Um, you would also have to build in some shoot-through protection to make sure that you're not enabling a high side and a low side uh, transistor at the same time, causing a direct short from battery to ground. Um, other concerns are, are thermal. Uh, so if, if there was a, an application where a low resistance um, either occurred across the motor due to some, some malfunction in the motor, or some external short was was uh, was given. Um, at that point in time, the the temperature of the IC could raise to such a level that would cause damage. Um, so in this case, uh, our integrated drivers offer offer uh, thermal protection as well. So in a, for dead time, uh, this is typically done in a discrete solution. This would be done with an MCU. So the MCU would control the gate signals in such a way um, to, um, to insert uh, a delay between enabling one transistor in the high side and then the other transistor in the low side. Um, in the integrated products from TI, the DRV uh, 8X solutions, this analog handshaking is integrated, um, so there's no extra work required from the, from the microprocessor. Thermal protection, this, this would require some sort of a, uh, a thermistor outside the device to, to sense uh, temperature. Um, typically, there's, there can be large gradients across the board, uh, so placement of this sensor it would, be, would be key and also difficult, especially if you had four discrete transistors, you may not be able to uh, accurately sense the temperature of, of each transistor. Um, so there would have to be a, a trade-off there just on placement. Um, in the integrated products, our, our temp sensors are integrated, and oftentimes we use multiple temp temperature sensors. So we would have a sensor on each FET, um, and then we would automatically uh, shut down the device when it exceeds uh, a threshold, typically 150 C. Overcurrent protection. Um, so this is, uh, our devices are fully protected, uh, output to output shorts, output to ground, as well as, as output to uh, supply. Uh, in this case, we're showing uh, an example of what an out to ground short would look like. Uh, the only thing in this case limiting the current is uh, the RDS on of, of the high side FET. Um, so you can see in this case, if you would have uh, you know VM across that uh, the RDS on of the high side FET, uh, 24 volts, and assuming a, a 1 ohm RDS on, you're looking at 24 amps uh, going through that transistor. In which case, it often results in a, a picture like you see over there on the on the right side, uh, with uh, extreme heat and bubbling of the mole compound and. Uh, quite a bit of damage to the integrated circuit. With, uh, with the OCP protection and the, the 8X products, we, we first 
uh, introduce an analog limit. Uh, this would uh, reduces the gate drive to the high side transistor, which increases the RDS on of the FET. Uh, so the first thing we do is, is just scale back on that gate drive and, and take that RDS on, take the, the bottom denominator there higher, uh, minimizing the current through the FET. Um, if this analog current, current persists for uh, several microseconds of deglitch time, then at that point in time, we completely shut off the FET and uh, go to a high Z state. This uh, protects the device. Um, many of our, our uh, devices will automatically recover once the, uh, the short is removed, um, or uh, some combination of auto recover and, and fault notification uh, that can be read back from a microprocessor. So let's, uh, let's move on to, to stepper drivers. Stepper drivers, common applications, uh, stage lighting, uh, security cameras, uh, antenna positioning, uh, cache machines, uh, also used commonly in point of sale. So uh, when you go to the store and, uh, and purchase something, that's typically a stepper motor driver that, that's moving the paper through the machine. Uh, textiles, a, a huge market for, for steppers. Um, and these are, are used in, in open loop uh, positioning control. So typically there is no encoder or anything uh, used externally. All the control is done um, within the driver circuit uh, and, and current is regulated and the, and the motor moves um, in an open loop positioning fashion. So how this is done, it's, it's very similar to a brushed in terms of, of drive electronics. Uh, instead of one H bridge that would be used for a brush motor, uh, two H bridges are used. Uh, and then there's two coils in a, in a stepper motor. There's a, an A phase and a B phase. The permanent magnet, it's essentially an inside out brushed motor where the, the permanent magnet resides on the rotor uh, and the, uh, the electromagnet is on the stator. So, and there's a, here's a picture of, uh, of one right here where you can see the, the permanent magnets, uh, alternating permanent magnets on the rotor, and then the motor windings on the, the stator side. So how these are controlled is, is just very similar to a brushed motor. We, we have current flowing through the phases, and we uh, enable and disable FETs in the H bridge uh, to, to move current through the electromagnet. If we want to change the polarity of the, uh, of the magnetic field, we move current in the opposite direction. So you can see here current moving in the forward current, uh, direction creates a north pole. Current moving in the reverse direction creates a south pole uh, in that particular phase. Same thing for the B phase. We move current in a forward direction for north, reverse direction for south. For a full stepping uh, stepper motor, typically stepper motors are specified in, in a certain mechanical degrees per step. Uh, so you may have a, a 1.8 mechanical degrees uh, per full step. Um, so this would be if you initially, if you go through a full stepping sequence, you would move 1.8 mechanical degrees. So in that case, for a full rotation, it would take uh, 200 uh, full steps in order to make a full mechanical revolution. So in this case, uh, for full stepping, no current regulation is required. So the, the full current uh, from, the, from the battery or from the power supply is applied across uh, the phases. So for step one, you actually have forward current moving uh, from A out one to A out two, and you have full current moving from B out one to B out two. So you can see there in the in the H bridges how that's how that's handled. For the next uh, part of the the full stepping sequence, uh, we're actually reversing current in the uh, in the B phase and still holding current in the A phase. 
for the, the next, uh, next part of the cycle, we are, uh, in this case, reversing current also in the A phase and holding current in the reverse direction in the B phase. And then finally, for the last part of the cycle, we are uh, re taking current back into the forward direction for the B phase. So this is a uh, this is would be a full step uh, type current waveform. Again, no current regulation is required. For micro stepping, in this case, where you want to move the motor somewhere in between a, a 1.8 degree uh, movement. Um, so in this case, we're, we're showing uh, quarter stepping, uh, which means that in order to, for a full rotation of the motor, you would actually have to issue 800 steps because um, you're, uh, you're actually you're multiplying by the, the, the amount of micro stepping you're doing. So in the case of micro stepping, it's, uh, this does require current regulation, which is, which is built in to our, our ADEX uh, drivers. We actually build in the, the truth table and the logic that's required. Um, and for this case, what we're showing here is fractional amounts of current that are moving through the windings. So, wind, uh, so the H-bridge is still enabled and disabled uh, very much in, in, a, in the same way uh, as it was before in full stepping. But in this case, we're actually um, we're controlling the amount of on time uh, for each of the bridges in order to uh, to issue a fractional amount of current. Uh, so for this particular step, we're actually we're we're 38.3 percent of full scale current is flowing through the H bridge, and almost full scale at 92.4 percent is flowing through the B phase. And if you look at this on a scope it starts to look sinusoidal. So the more levels of micro-stepping that you do, um, and we have one driver that's capable of 256 uh, degrees of micro-stepping, in that case, if you look at it on a current probe, on a scope, it, it will look almost sinusoidal. Um, but we are regulating current at each one of these, these steps. So how is this current regulation done? Um, in our devices, it's uh, current flows through an external sense resistor. Uh, it is compared to a reference voltage. Uh, and that reference voltage can either be internally generated or provided via an external analog pin. Um, an amplifier actually uh, provides some amplification for the voltage across the sense resistor that is proportional to current. And that, uh, after that voltage is, is gained up, it's then compared to the reference. And by the formula there at the, at the top of the top right of the slide, um, the regulated current is, is VREF divided by the gain um, times the, the, the sense resistor there. So it's, uh, the method for, for current regulation is, is basically current chopping. So as, the, um, as it's tripped, as the, the circuit is uh, tripped, once we hit that trip point, which is IF, established by IFS there, um, we go into what we call a decay state. So in this state, we are either in a slow decay or a fast decay or, or some sort of a mixed uh, portion where it's some fast and some slow. And in this case, the, the drivers are either um, the low side drivers are enabled uh, or the opposite high side and low side drivers enabled in a fast decay state. So in this case, um, you're, you're not in a drive state. Once the current decays to a, uh, after a certain period of time, um, then the driver is re-enabled. So you can see that the yellow periods here in the, in the slide show where the driver has been re-enabled and again hitting a trip point and then going back into a decay state. So this slide just is, uh, has more details on that showing uh, I trip for the current uh, level. The uh, T drive is the amount of, of, of time that we're driving. 
and we actually the the T drive time is controlled by the the motor parameter or so it's it's the resistance and the inductance in the motor that determines what that drive time is um, once we trip then the off time is is what what we are in control of in the within the within the driver um, and then um, at that point in time we go through a, a decay state so in uh, in slow decay you can see by by this animation uh, we actually uh, we we trip overcurrent we're in the drive state there in the beginning in the red portion of the of the slide and during the off state uh, we are recirculating current across the low side FETs. I'll show that animation again. So during the blue period, we're actually uh, recirculating current. Um, after we re-enable the driver, um, there is some blanking time that we insert uh, where we won't trip. But after that blanking time, if we are if the device is uh, above the the trip point. Um, then again we go back into this this off state so slow decay has the the smallest amount of ripple uh, but it also uh, with the with particular stepper motors you can get into a runaway condition uh, because of this T blank period you can get into a runaway condition where you can have loss of regulation uh, with just slow decay Fast decay uh, actually reverses the state of current, so it goes essentially from a forward drive to a reverse drive condition. Uh, if we want to speak in terms of, of what we looked at with the brushed motor, where we actually enable the opposite FETs. Um, so the the disadvantage here is it's going to have the largest amount of ripple, as you can you can see there in the waveform. Um, current does decay down to uh, to zero point and then the H bridge is disabled so we do go into a high Z state once the current uh, approaches zero um, but in this case it's it's you're less likely to lose current regulation or have current run away uh, but the disadvantage is just the large amount of, of ripple that, that occurs uh, in this mode Mixed decay is really the, the best of both worlds. So we have some period of, of fast decay followed by a period of, of slow decay. Um, in some of our drivers, this is, this is settable. This, this period of fast versus slow decay is, is adjustable with external resistors. Um, some drivers are, are fixed uh, where we have settings where you have a certain amount of fast decay and a certain amount of percentage of fast decay, like say 25%, and then the rest of the period would be uh, in, a, in a slow decay state. So um, in how this, uh, how this works, the, the interface is, is very simple. It's a step and direction interface. So uh, a step is issued from a microprocessor. Uh, direction is the direction of the motor, either counterclockwise or clockwise, and this direction pin is either high or low. And then, as you can see, every time we pulse that step input, uh, current is increased or decreased through the windings, uh, depending on an internal uh, lookup table. Um, so, uh, and we call this we call this an indexer. So um, we are since we're essentially indexing from one state in the truth table to the next state in the truth table every time a, a pulse is received. So an example of a device like this is uh, the DRV 8846. Uh, this device was recently uh, introduced in the market. Uh, it's a four to eighteen volt driver. Uh, two full bridges. So for a stepper motor, you always need two full bridges. You also have independent current regulation because you are regulating current different, differently through each phase. Uh, up to 32 uh, steps of microstepping or, or indexing. Uh, the biggest advantage of this device is that it has a feature called adaptive decay. Um, and this is uh, a, a pin that you can set high and put it in this mode and in this mode we actually uh, the driver is, has the built-in intelligence to choose the best decay mode 
depending on the uh, the currents and the winding. So instead of having to choose slow or fast or, or some portion of mixed decay, the device actually makes the decision on its own um, and uh, achieves the, the best performance with, with no tuning. Um, so in this case, you can hook up multiple motors to it and not have to, to tune uh, the decay settings, um, which, which takes out a, a lot of the frustration of, of uh, working with stepper motors. So finally, I'm going to talk about uh, brushless DC motors, which will uh, which will go into uh, Ross's presentation, where he'll go into a lot more details on a on a brushless DC design, which uh, can be the and typically is the most complex type of design uh, to do. Um, in a brushless motor, uh, it's it's very similar to a, a stepper motor, uh, in that the permanent magnets are on the rotor and the electromagnets are on the stator. So commutation is performed by switching the current, um, turning on and off the stator or electromagnets. Uh, so you're essentially, uh, the, your rotor is, is chasing a rotating magnetic field. Uh, the rotor position is usually sensed by Hall effect sensors. Uh, so there's uh, some Hall effects from uh, Texas Instruments, the DRV 5000 series. Um, it were uh, introduced this year, um, or encoders are used if, if position control is, is needed. Um, or finally, there's also a, a, a wide range of, of sensorless techniques uh, that are either based off of sensing current or sensing voltage. So here's a, uh, an animation showing, um, showing how, how current is, is moved through the individual phases. So it's, this motor is also referred to as a three-phase motor. Uh, it's driven by uh, three half bridges. Uh, so in a brush motor, you had a single H bridge that was required. A stepper motor was, was two H bridges on the drive side. And for a brushless motor, you're, uh, you need three half bridges. Um, so current is, is, reg is controlled through individual phases and the permanent magnets on the rotor align to the electromagnetic field as shown in this animation. So here is an animation just showing how Hall sensors can be used to commutate the motor. Uh, with three Hall sensors, you, you end up getting uh, six logic states. Uh, you can see there on the, on the top side with Hall sensor one, two, and three, depending on if the Hall sensors, and these are digital Hall sensors, so they're either a high or a low state. Um, with, those, uh, with those states, you can see that the transistors are cycled on off two phases are on at any point in time either a low side or a high side and that's shown there with the solid uh, green circles show transistors in the on state and the uh, the transistors in the off state are, are open uh, circles there are white circles so you can see how any one point in time one of the phases is going to be high Z while the other phases are either in a high state or a low state. So an example of a driver that, that works uh, with this technique is uh, the DRV8307. So this is a, an integrated driver that actually has the Hall comparators built in. Uh, so it's a direct interface to external Hall sensors. Uh, the transistors, uh, in this case, are external to the IC, so it is a pre-driver, uh, which gives you the flexibility to, to size those transistors based off your application. Um, it's fully protected. There's an external uh, sense resistor there for measuring the current through the bridges and providing uh, some protection there. Uh, and it's in a, a small QFN package, the 6x6 uh, package. So Ross will go into a, a design using this device um, in, his, uh, in his following slides. So at this point, let me transition over to Ross. 
uh, who will, will take you through building a BLDC motor system. Hi everyone, this is Ross Eisenbeis. Uh, thanks for joining in. I'm going to be talking about designing your own brushless DC motor system. So as Ryan mentioned, BLDCs have some nice advantages over brush motors, mainly because the torque drive is contactless. So that makes for better reliability, longevity, quieter operation, and the possibility for much higher RPMs. The picture you see here is what's called an eight-pole motor because there are eight permanent magnet poles. And the part that spins, which is called the rotor, has magnets attached. So you can imagine that when current flows through the coils shown in one of two directions, that causes opposing and attracting magnetic forces which spin the rotor. And most BLDCs use three wires leading to those coils. Next key, please. At the highest level, what you need the motor to actually do is spin at some RPM and push with some torque. Those are the, the two fundamental mechanical needs. That applies if you're making a, an electric drill, if you're making a fan that blows air, or a valve that closes. Uh, next key. Gear ratios are extremely common and they directly trade off RPM for torque. So like this picture sh shows, if there's a 10 to 1 ratio in the gears, the big gear turns 10 times slower and with 10 times the torque. And there will be a small torque loss due to friction. Next key, please. Some secondary mechanical considerations include the spin-up time to a steady state RPM and any overshoot. Um, some applications will want spin-ups in just 100 milliseconds, for example. Another possible system requirement is the wow and flutter. And that refers to the speed variation. So a simple example of that is like a record player or a CD player where you want the spinning speed to be consistent. Um, and if you imagine the motor generating voltage pulses and you measure it with an oscilloscope, the wow and flutter look just like clock jitter. Finally, reliability is obviously also important, so you'll want to select a motor manufacturer that has a good track record. Next slide. On the previous slide, I said that RPM and torque are the two main outputs from the motor. The torque curve shows the RPM versus torque. So typical brush or brushless DC motors will spin faster if there's less loading applied. Next key. Motor output power is simply the RPM times torque and times a constant to adjust for units. Next key. One horsepower is defined as about 746 watts. And most small motors that we're talking about aren't anywhere near one watt or, or one horsepower. Two more ways that motors are specified are with the constants KV and KT. And KV is simply the RPM per volt that the motor spins at. And KT is the torque you get per current. Next slide. BLDC motors can be constructed in many different ways. Um, the one shown on the left here is sometimes called an in-runner, and that's because the rotor is on the inside. The one on the right is an outrunner because the outer ring in the motor has the magnets and that's what spins. And then as the bottom picture shows, there are many different configurations possible. Um, and, uh, and generally, the more poles you have, the more torque the motor will generate. Uh, next slide. Now I'm going to talk about electronics integration. So this first motor has no ICs inside. It's just windings and magnets. There are just three wires coming out, and BLDCs like this require sensorless control. Sensorless control requires a more complex controller that will often sense the back EMF voltage that's generated by the motor in order to know where the magnets are and commutate at exactly the right time. And uh, TIA has done some pretty impressive developments on this and has some algorithms that are called TI InstaSpin. Next key. The next level of integration has Hall effect sensors inside. The three sensors need to be placed in certain spots inside the 
that are close to the rotating magnet. And their logic levels tell the controller when to drive each of the three phase windings. This is called censored control, and it generally works better than sensorless for low RPM operation because there's not much back EMF to sense at low RPMs. And also, if the load torque has unpredictable variance, that can also uh, potentially cause problems with sensorless controllers. Next key. This third level of integration puts the power fats and the controller right on the motor PCB. There's often a connector to this board with pins for power and ground, some CMOS inputs for enable and direction, um, a speed input signal, and a speed output signal. The speed input can take the form of being a clock where the duty cycle communicates the speed, or it can be clock frequency based, or it can be an analog voltage range. The speed output pin is typically a signal that's generated by the motor, and its number of pulses per second, or its frequency, is proportional to the motor's RPM. It's often labeled FG for frequency generator or TAC for tachometer. Next key. And this brings us to the highest level of integration where all the intelligence and the microcontroller are right on the motor PCB. This can especially be useful for industrial components like remotely located valves or pumps and only high-level commands are sent to this board, such as close the valve to 75%. Commands can be sent over any interface protocol, including Modbus, CAN, or a 4 to 20 milliamp current loop. Next key. Here we have a simple block diagram of a typical BLDC system. So starting on the right, the motor is shown with three phase coils. The hall sensors feed back the rotor position to the controller. The power MOSFETs are N-channel, and they control how much current enters the motor. They work with fast switching applied to the FET gates, and because the motor coils have a high inductance, the fast switching of the FETs results in slow changing current that is shaped like a sawtooth. Gate drivers are well suited at controlling the FETs for two reasons. One is they have a high current output, so they can quickly charge and discharge those physically large gates that have a high capacitance and high charge to overcome. And the second reason is gate drivers will apply um, about 6 to 10 volts higher of a voltage than the transistor's source, which is the bottom side of the FETs. So to give an example, if the motor voltage is 24 volts, the gate driver on the very top will apply 34 volts to the FET gate. And that makes the VGS of the transistor 10 volts. And that will bring the transistor to a very low RDS on state. And then the low side FETs can be driven with 10 volts with respect to ground to still get that 10 volt VGS. Uh, next key. Moving on, the controller integrates quite a, new, quite a few nice features. Um, there can be current regulation where the external sense resistor is used to produce a voltage that is based on the motor current. And then also in the, in the center you can see that there's a, an assortment of protection features where the controller will automatically shut down if there's an abnormal voltage or current or if the device heats up to, for instance, over 150 degrees C, it'll just shut down automatically. Um, and then there can also be configuration options for things like gate drive frequency, the current, and the dead time. Um, there can also be status outputs for the microcontroller. Next key. There are two main types of speed input issued to this BLDC controller. Um, one of them, shown on the top, involves the microcontroller PWMing three or six inputs to this controller, and each input corresponds to those six FETs on, on the right side. And in that case, the MCU requires intelligence of when it should commutate. 
and that can come from either the hall sensors or a sensorless detection method. So if it's from the halls, the hall signals would actually go to the MCU instead of the BLDC as shown. And then the other type of controller is one that has integrated commutation logic and it only needs a simple speed command uh, given from the MCU. Um, that speed command can be in the form of a analog voltage, it can be a duty cycle of a clock, or it can be a frequency of a clock. And on the bottom left side, you can see a list of some TI devices for each of these categories. Um, and in case you're wondering, on the top right, um, this is just showing what actually causes the RPM that you get from the motor. So primarily it's based on the motor design itself or its KV constant. It's also based on the load torque applied, the VM voltage, and the duty cycle that those power FETs are applied with. Next key, please. Now I'm going to talk about what to consider when you start a new design. So for starters, do you want sensorless or censored? And for simple fans, they tend to be great candidates for sensorless because um, the spin-up is very repeatable and it's easy to design around. Next key. If you're going to go censored, you have another question about do you want to use Hall ICs or Hall elements? And elements are some pennies cheaper, slightly cheaper. Um, the way you use them is different though. Um, you need to limit the current through them with series sense resistors and they will output an analog differential voltage. ICs on the other hand have a simple power supply, it's typically 3 volts or 5 volts, and the output is a logic level with an open drain output. So the, the TI DRV5013 is a Hall IC that we specifically designed for BLDC motors. Next key. Next you'll want to consider whether to use a VLDC controller that has integrated FETs or one with gate drivers that require external FETs. External FETs can support hundreds of amps and their low RDS on minimizes heat dissipation. Integrated FETs on the other hand save cost and board space but the current capability is much more limited, um, often in the 2 to 8 amp range. So, as always, current will produce heat. So, you want to keep in mind your, your thermal dissipation as well. Next key. As previously mentioned, you can choose between integrated commutation or commutation that's based on the microcontroller's firmware. Next key. Next topic is how do you pick a motor voltage? This is sort of an easy one because the motor specs will call out a specific voltage to use, um, but functionally speaking, increasing the voltage will linearly increase RPM and it allows for faster RPM because that causes the phase current to rise faster. Next key. So the next consideration is motor current. And typically in the motor world, current equals torque. Um, usually the highest current will flow right when the motor starts to spin up or when it suddenly comes to a stalled stop. And motors can consume huge amounts of current if, if current is not controlled and optimized systems will actively limit how much current is allowed because that has the nice advantages of loosening the requirements of your external power supply as well as how much bulk capacitance you need. And the, the, the continuous current consumed, um, you know, it, it can be limited. Um, it's based on the load torque, like I mentioned. Um, if you're using a sense resistor, you want to be sure to pick one that's rated for the appropriate power, which is I squared R going through it. Common ratings are in the 2 to 3 watt range, for example. Next slide. Next, if you're using hall sensors, the manufacturer of the motor um, should tell you exactly where to place them because there's specific spots. Uh, but mathematically speaking, the number of angular degrees between each one should be 2 divided by the number of poles times 120. 
and that provides a 120 degree phase difference between the three hull signals. Next key. When selecting discrete external power FETs, uh, many controllers require all of them to be n-channel. Um, the max BVS rating should, should be higher than the motor voltage. Um, the max VGS must exceed the gate driver output of the gate driver controller. And then ID refers to the, the output current or the, the current capability through the FET. That obviously needs to be high enough for your application. And then also keep in mind that the FET turn on time will depend on its gate charge and the gate driver's output current. Next key. Um, the last consideration I'll mention here is whether to use closed loop speed control for having a known RPM and also whether to implement sinusoidal current drive for low acoustic noise. And both of these are integrated in the very interesting uh, DRV8308. Next key. Now I'm going to just briefly cover how to create a custom board shape using the Altium software. Um, so to do that, you first place your lines or the circle, you select it, and then you define the board shape from the selected objects. Um, you'll probably also want to create a keep out from that same shape. Then for cutouts on your board, you can draw a shape, select it, uh, create it into a region, and then followed by double clicking it and selecting board cutout. Um, finally, um, I always check my work by using the 3D view and you can make sure that all the holes are correct. Next slide. So engineers like myself have been making reference designs at TI um, and we're releasing them to the web with all the files, all the CAD files, as well as test data. So what's shown here are four VLDC reference designs that we've made. And in the next few slides, I'm going to dig into the speed controlled 24 volt VLDC outrunner. Next slide. So for that board, this is the entire schematic. And at the center is the DRV8308. On the left side are the Hall effect sensors. On the top portion are the FETs. The right side has the power connector and capacitors. And on the bottom is an oscillator, which generates a 170 hertz reference clock for the speed control system. Um, if you look below the FETs, you'll see that I used five resistors in parallel for the sense resistor. This is common practice to use multiple 0805 or 0603 resistors instead of a single large 2512 size, for example, because that approach can be a little bit cheaper. Next slide. And here you have the board um, top-down view. Um, the motor phase windings come through the slot in the top left that you can see. Um, and one really cool thing about this board is that the external connector is just simply power and ground. So once you apply 24 volts, the whole motor just automatically spins. Uh, next slide. Here's a view inside the motor. So there are 10 magnet poles that are buried inside that gray ring on the right side. And if you look at the board on the far right side, there's an IC U4. Um, that's one of the three hull sensors. And you can imagine it's detecting whether there's a north or south pole beneath it. Next slide. Here's the torque curve that I measured with this motor. Um, so since there's closed loop speed control, there's always 2,054 RPM that it spins at across the, the entire operating torque range. Um, so as motors age and bearings wear out and temperatures change and other physical parameters gather, maybe dirt builds up in the motor, uh, normal open loop VLDCs will have a change in RPM over time due to those different mechanical factors. But the nice thing about closed loop control is you get a known fixed RPM at all times. Next slide. 
And then these graphs show a response. Um, the waveform is RPM plotted as a voltage. Um, so in these two graphs, I'm changing, I'm doing a step change in the load torque and seeing how, how well the speed control compensates. Um, now typically in the motor world, motors have momentum and it takes a relatively long time for them to change in speed, whereas the electrical feedback is happening about 100 times a second. So there's only a very small overshoot that you can see. Next slide. And this is a look at the motor current. So the DRV8308 has built-in sine wave current drive. And on some motor types, enabling this will completely silence the motor that's, that normally generates a humming sound. And it also reduces the torque ripple due to this smoothly varying current. Next slide. This last slide covers some final key features and considerations that will help you optimize the performance out of your BLDC. So first is single hall commutation. So um, th this is a feature that is also integrated in the DRV8308. Um, when the motor first starts spinning, all three hall sensors are used in order to drive the phases. But once the target speed is reached, you can switch over to only use one hall sensor and then split it up in software into, uh, into three. Um, and hull sensors can have a little bit of mismatch due to the physical placement or just device device variation. So using one hull will actually improve your flutter performance. Next key. Next we have commutation timing. Um, it can be slightly skewed to be a little bit forward or backward in time. So if the hull sensor placement isn't absolutely perfect, the commutation of each phase won't be perfectly aligned with the back EMF, and that will hurt efficiency a little bit. So it's nice to have the ability to tweak the timing to the left or to the right. Next key. Um, another nice feature about this design, which the, the, the controller has built in, is the ability to limit motor current to whatever you want based on the sense resistor value. So in this case, it's set to 5.2 amps. Next slide. Um, this design also has spy configurable gate drive current. Um, that allows you to optimize and, and fine tune the switching time and also minimize the noise and EMI produced by switching those FETs. Next key. The design has minimal bomb cost. There's not even an MCU on this board. There's also no regulator because I use the 5 volt regulator that is integrated to the DRV A308. Uh, next key. Um, and finally, protection is important since no one wants their system to start on fire when things go wrong. So there's all sorts of protection features built in. Next slide. So that's it for me. I, I thank each of you for attending. Um, you can directly reach me and my coworkers by using the engineer to engineer forum at the link shown. And now I'm going to pass it back to Carrie. Are you there, Carrie? Hey everyone. Yep, I'm here. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone and both to you, uh, Ross and Brian, for a great presentation. And um, as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and you will receive an email with a link to the recording in the next 24 hours. So thanks again for joining us and have a great day.